is there is there some major disruption where we just have this dramatic change in technique to have a bigger positive impact on frontal surface area than the negative effect it might have on propulsion? Yeah, so this this then touches upon, let's say, uh, one of my favorite areas, and that's biofeedback. In cycling, we have extremely good tools for biofeedback today. You have a power meter and you have a GPS. So just these two combined, for example- Speed and power perfectly. Yes, like yep. we, we talked about last time when you were out riding 200 watts constant, and basically yep. you see you getting faster. So uh, you, you have this direct biofeedback because you as long as you ride enough, you will basically start to get a very good feeling for when you sit at a certain power and you start to do different things. Suddenly you creep up like half a kilometer power or one. Like for a per person, when they start cycling or they cycle a little bit like, for them, they, 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 it doesn't become interesting enough yet because there are other things that is basically more challenging for them to, to master. But for people that do a lot of biking like yourself, it, it's, 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 uh, it's where you exactly start to pay, let's say, attention to those, let's say, even half a kilometer per hour, maybe even you're getting below that as well, where you start to really pay attention to this. Um, and then over time, simply also because wind and other factors ma makes a difference too. Running, this is also a place where we have really good biofeedback tools. You have your watch, you're running, and you can have a look at it. And now we have also really good power meters in running as well. How does that work? So most of these are, there are some of these power meters in running today that re requires, some of them requires an insole. So you put basically an insole inside and they basically measure the forces. So it's a force applied. plate yes. inside your yes, shoe. Yeah. And then you have other ones that are more motion capture devices. So they basically, you rather input your body weight. And since basically when you're touching on the ground with one foot, you're basically carrying your whole weight there. So as long as you have a good enough motion capture device that capable of let's say detect or that are able to capture the three-dimensional accelerations you can then basically also say some well you know you know the force because you basically have to carry your weight so that's how so you but so you can directly measure this with a force plate um insole or you could indirectly do it with motion capture, but I assume the motion capture only works on a treadmill. You're not gonna be able to- No, so the motion captures today, they are become so small. They are basically a small device that you attach to a shoe and they are, oh, when, wow. when we validate these in- Are the, these commercially in, available products, yes. both of these? Yes, so if you if you, mesh, if you if you go to a laboratory and you basically test this, you will basically see that. Uh, so we have been for a long time been working together with Stride. Uh, I started working with them when they were in beta stage and we've gone through there, but basically they are so accurate today that when you, when you uh, measure... First of all, do you have any idea how much you just ruined my wife's life? <laughs> like, do you have Tell any... I so how many minutes do you think after this podcast am I going to be on my computer ordering these devices, <laughs> jamming them on her shoes? You know, she's, she's running the Boston Marathon next year. Yeah. And uh, I'm convinced she's actually going to run it faster than she did her first Boston Marathon 20 mm -hmm. years ago because she actually now works with a running coach. And her qualifying time this year... Um, was only one minute slower than her qualifying time 19 years earlier. Um, and again, it's just because she's more structured in her training, not because she listens to a word I say, she doesn't, but she's like finally at least agreeing to use heart rate and velocity for tempo training. So now like she's not listening to this podcast, obviously she, one of her friends will probably hear this and tell her to listen, but she is now, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to implement power training for her running. Yes. And she's going to curse me all day long because she doesn't <laughs> want data. But how could you not do, how is every runner not doing this? I, I think this has to do with a lot with, with tradition. And also that even when power meters were introduced, it's easy to look back and say like, why, why, why didn't we have this before? Or even how power, there's so much information we can extract from a single power meter today, which is, I say, beyond people's uh, comprehension. Still, we only use the power number that is there, and we use it even in a one-dimensional context, FTP, for example, or critical power. Uh, the amount of information you can get out of this is crazy, because we are not going to talk about this today. We I, I still kind of use normalized power and other... No. Away, we like, never use it? No, we only go by raw numbers. I only oh. work by raw numbers all the time. So I don't condense it down to a single metric. I use only raw numbers. But the, the implication here is that uh, even when you look at studies that are looking at gross, effic gross efficiency, for example, in the old days or even today, uh, there are like one thing you consider as a net mechanical power. So you, the interface between basically looking at your gross or let's say gross, uh, gross efficiency is where you take VO2 yep. and we're already there. Most people understand that, okay, you have a difference between 
net net uh, net auction consumption and gross auction consumption you would ideally like to have the net auction consumption but there are other things there but in cycling actually also what we only consider there is the net mechanical power you don't consider right. the gross mechanical power and should you really look at the let's say on your biochemical efficiency you you should not look at the net mechanical power you should look at the gross mechanical power but as even before we start to get into vectors power vectors force vectors and other things uh, even in a three-dimensional plane as you do cycling because this is something we can extract from the power meters today so when running so in running yes so one of the things you have you have more degrees of freedom yes. there's more inefficiency yeah. there's probably a lower relationship or a, a, a more strained relationship between between gross and net power this is maybe one of the reasons for why it is not as widely adopted uh, in in running as it is in cycling, because it is still debated what really is running power. How do you really quantify it? Uh, and this is something that even I I even discuss with with the, with the team at Stride. So when we we are having our regular calls and we are diving into the topic, then even we also sometimes um, uh, I would say I have our different opinions on 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 how this really should be looked at because. If you want to translate this into running, then you have to look at only at the, let's say, the propulsive power. Like, could you imagine seeing this? In, I mean, have, have they put these in Olympic sprinters and seen the power numbers there? Yeah. No, it has. It, let's say, put this way, commercially available, this has its limitations because since you do motion capture, you need to do a little bit of filtering. You can't. You can't take out because it's going to be so much noise. Exactly because, as, as you said, you have so many degrees of, of, of freedom. Yeah. If, if you're going to output all, let's say, all the vectors that basically you were able to measure with, let's say, just with strain gauge based power meters on a bike today, people wouldn't be able to utilize. That's why you condense it down to a single power meter, let's say, a single number that is there for most people. But if you had that. If you had that force plate chip in yeah. their insole, yeah. you could at least capture uh, force normalized to weight with each step, right? Yes. So what you what you can do, and this is validated. So if you, for example, run on a track, a track which has force plates, or you run on specialized treadmills that has force plates integrated in them, you will basically see that the curves are the same. So this is the way. Let's say this is the external validation of yep. the device is good, uh, both in terms of that it captures uh, the, the the force curves, but also here really when you have motion capture devices, you can also capture the foot path as yep. well. So this is something we can visualize in 3D today after the event when you are doing running and we can see what happened there fresh fatigued throughout the race when it's technical and other things but i think the reason why this is not as widely adopted is because in science this is still debated on how do we really capture how do we really capture and quantify uh mechanical po- or power for running stride have taken uh smart approach to this uh, to make it let's say commercially viable and that is that they quant- output it as a um, let's say call it a metabolic power so if you actually went on a treadmill and you went running and you looked at it versus your oxygen consumption you will basically see that this this matches perfectly with cycling and that's without having a bicycle near you at all so yep. you could say that, well this is what you expect so when you're at a certain power then with this would have a certain metabolic cost but what how i use it i, I, I don't like it because i don't like let's say modeled numbers i want to have raw numbers so in my case i basically i'm extracting basically the let's say the net and the gross mechanical power or the positive and the negative mechanical power because these are the components i want to have because i have view to master i have metabolic devices so i i don't need a metabolic equivalent i want to have the raw because i'm using as an interface to gauge the difference like for example on a formula one car what really matters in the end there what hits the ground yeah, what really matters in the end there is how fast can you go around the track for the full event with uh, a certain amount of fuel because there is a limitation to how much fuel yeah. you can have in your car. Like that's the that's the true input and the true output. Your engine output in this kind of thing is actually secondary. It's easy to think that yeah. oh, we want to have the biggest engine, but it, big engine without efficiency is still bad. So this is the, the engine. It becomes more of a device to measure. Let's say you look at the power and you look at how efficiently are you able to translate this fuel out into speed over let's say the event or velocity. So uh, it, the, for me, having access to the net mechanical power. And gross mechanical power and then you have the metabolic devices this allow me to on the one side look at when we change something in running so let's say you change for example your shoes or you change your your training you can now i can have a much more granular understanding of um, am i influencing the biomechanical part of, yeah. of, of of the training or is it the biochemical part of the training but in order to do so you have to have that interface that basically uh, let's say it distinguishes between gross mechanical power and net mechanical power and the interface between gross mechanical power and net mechanical power is only the let's say work efficiency like how efficiently are you working but not 
metabolizing or or moving because you're in the end you have to take this power and and and, and be able to output into 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 velocity <laughs> Thank you.